All right. So good evening, guys. It's uh, it's February 23rd. I just want to touch base with everybody about um, about grades. I am caught up in Canvas on the grade book. Currently, it looks like the uh, highest score in the class is around 200 points. So when you look at your total points in Canvas, um, you can kind of uh, calculate your score there. Um, I think that the Canvas gradebook will also kind of show you the, your, your estimated grade uh, as you go. So um, are there any questions about grades? So what it's looking like based on uh, the high score right now, uh, if you have around 180 points or more, you should have an A. About 160 points, you should have a B. 140 points, you should have a C. And 120 points would put you at a D. Anything below 120 is currently not passing. So very good. All right, you all can hear me okay? Yes. Awesome, thank you. All right, guys, so I'm gonna try to share my screen here real quick. I wanna show you where we're at with Canvas. Uh, let me switch this to student view. Can you see my screen okay again? Yeah. All right, thank you. So at the top here, this is what you should see when you log into Canvas. At the top, you should see student opportunities. When you click on student opportunities, um, there's a couple things. Car Career Scholarship Program is a scholarship that's available to you. The deadline to register is about 10 days from now. It's May 3rd. Um, if you click on it, I usually include the link in description. There are scholarships up to $5,000 each uh, for a total of $105,000. So here's the newsletter. And that link will take you to a newsletter that looks like this that includes additional links where you will find a application, okay? So there are, there's a lot of money available for all of you. Um, this is the California New Car Dealers Association. Um, these guys, they have a hard time giving money away because people don't apply. So my suggestion is please apply and if they happen to give you money, then that's just a bonus for you. Um, I know, you know, it's not a university. We're spending tens of thousands of dollars per semester, but it is a uh, it is a cost for many of you to go to school uh, here at Miramar. So, so this is uh, the first one I have available: so the uh, new car dealers. The next one is the ASCEF. Um, they are also taking applications, $500 to $1,000 each. These are Automotive Scholarship Foundation. Um, so this is through ASCCA. This is the Automotive, oh, I forget the acronym. Let's see, I click the link here, it should pull it up. Automotive Scholarship Central, ASCCA is the Automotive Service Councils of California. Um, so this is also a very big scholarship program. Um, again, it's available to all of you. These are all the donors. And then, um, and then it goes on to talk about the, um, the supporting documents and there's an application uh, link in here, okay? So I think the deadline for this one, does it say on the page here? Tips for applicants. I think the deadline is on my on my homepage here. March 31st, it says for that scholarship. Right. So for any of you who, who've had to swipe a credit card or something for this semester, like these, this is definitely something to consider. Okay. And then the last one here that I have available is a job opportunity. I don't know if anyone saw this. But um, this is a message that I received from my department chair, uh, Mario uh, Juarez from VW Kearney Mesa is looking for some express techs, three express techs. They have to be full-time and work every Saturday. Let me know if you know anybody. 
students, these deals or these job opportunities are coming across my desk very often. So if you're in the process of looking for work, this is definitely a place to uh, consider. Uh, if you are interested in this position, what you need to do is contact me and then I will make the connection, okay? Uh, I, I don't like to put the, the manager's phone numbers here because I just don't want random calls. I wanna make sure that we kind of screen it just out of respect for the managers are very busy, busy people. So, um, so anyways, that's the student opportunities. Any questions about the student opportunities uh, or comments? Uh, thanks for the message, Elias. Uh, we'll be here. All right. So, um, so again, th this is the module here, student opportunities. Keep an eye on that. I'm, every time I get something new, I post it here. Okay. Um, then there's always a Zoom link will be at the top. So hopefully you guys were able to use that tonight to find my class. There's the COVID-19 safe lab practices. Um, I could probably move that to the bottom of the course. There's safety requirements, which is the SP2 stuff that uh, I think everybody has completed. Thank you for doing that. The course pretest, and then we roll into chapter 12 and 13, which you should be done with. And I opened today chapter 14. Um, I was having trouble with Canvas last week. So I didn't have access to all my stuff. So if you uh, you know, were waiting over the weekend for me to open this, I apologize. Um, that's just something that had happened. So let me see if I have any people in my waiting room here. All right, light crowd. All right, so chapter 14 is engine lubrication theory. Okay, so we'll get into that in a minute. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out that I did here on chapter 14 is at the very bottom, I put, there's a course called Motor Oil 101. Can you guys see that? Can you all see Motor Oil 101? Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. So when you click on Motor Oil 101, um, the instructions are quite simple. You're gonna click on the link, log in, complete the course, uh, print your certificate as a PDF and submit the file here where it says start assignment, okay? When you click it, it's gonna take you to the SP2 website. If you're logged in, it'll take you straight to the course. Um, and then what you do is you just kind of hit the side arrow until you get to, you gotta watch the video. And then after the video, you hit the side arrow again. Um, there's a summary and then you can take the exam, okay? So what we're gonna cover tonight, um, I will touch on the things that they talk about in the video, uh, but in the video, they go into a lot of detail. So I, I do see a lot of value um, in that Valvoline course. I usually have all of my high school students take it uh, as well as my college students. So there is definitely value in understanding how motor oil works, where it comes from, and some of the myths uh, that come along with different types of engine oils, okay? So that is the uh, SP2 deal. Um, so going back to modules, okay? We got all our normal quizzes and reading in chapter 14. Then again, chapter 14, resources and media gallery. Um, and then I added the chapter 14 and 15 labs here under the um, chapter 14 material. Uh, there's two task sheets, C732 and C736. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about those tonight. One of them is testing the oil pressure. And the other one is testing uh, oil pressure sensors. So we'll spend a little time talking about that. Um, if you haven't noticed at the beginning of the course, I like to cover most of the diagnostics. So we've covered so far compression testing, uh, leak down testing. We did the cranking um, noise compression test, vacuum test, um, and running compression test. So we've done a handful of tests so far. 
I know for the, my Monday night group, uh, we haven't done all of them with the Monday night group yet um, because they've only had me for one night. But I think I have, um, by next week, we should be able to catch up for most of you. For my Wednesday night students, if you haven't had a chance to, um, to complete your, your labs, we'll have to schedule a time uh, to see if it's possible for you to come in and do that. Okay. For the chapter uh, 13 I'm talking about. Uh, cap modules. So some of you may already have done this. If you have not, there is a Mopar CAP application. CAP stands for Chrysler Apprenticeship Program. Um, this is a program where Chrysler shares curriculum with us um, and we introduce students to the Chrysler curriculum and some of the Chrysler products. Uh, so uh, in order to be eligible for Chrysler positions, if, and if you wanna go work for Chrysler or considering it, um, what you want to do is you want to apply here for the Mopar CAP program. This will give you access to some of the online resources that we have and, um, and, and, and then open up, like I said, opportunity for, for jobs and internships in the future. So when you download this form, it's quite simple. Uh, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to print this. You're going to fill it out. Okay, fill out as much as you can. Uh, sign it and date it. Make sure you read the, uh, you know, the, the information here about um, what the CAP program is and what your agreement is with Chrysler after you submit this form, okay? Uh, and then when you're done, uh, you're going to go and return it to Mr. Kennedy. His office is across from the restrooms in the automotive building. Okay? Is there anybody who does not know where that is who might need help? figuring that out. Okay, well, it sounds like everybody knows where that's at. So um, that's everything I have before we uh, get into the slideshow. So um, it sounds like I don't have any questions. If there's something that comes up from that first part there uh, about Canvas, just pop it in the chat and I'll be happy to answer it. I'm gonna get into chapter 14, which is lubrication system theory and operation. Um, so lubrication is essentially the oiling system of the vehicle. So I have a slideshow, it's a pretty fair slideshow. I, di I didn't create this slideshow, it's the one that came with CDX. So I'm going to share that and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to learn what we need to learn. Uh, like I said uh, before, I like this to be like an open style forum. So if you guys have questions, comments, concerns, um, you can unmute yourselves and just kind of you know say what you need to say or pop it in the chat and I'll be sure to address it, okay? So here we go. I'm going to hit, let's see here. Uh oh. I guess I haven't used this in a long time here. Where's the present button? Slideshow, here we go. From beginning, there it is. All right, can you all see the slideshow that says CDX? Yeah. Yep. Excellent, perfect, thank you. All right, so when I hit the down arrow or the space bar, it's supposed to do something. There we go. Chapter 14 is engine lubrication theory. It says there are no NATEF tasks for this chapter. I, I will be jumping around chapters. After chapter 14, we're gonna jump into cooling system theory and talk about cooling system diagnosis. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll be jumping uh, into cylinder heads after that. Uh, and then from cylinder heads, we'll get into the engine block. And then from the engine block, we'll go back into cooling systems um, and so on and so forth. So, so we do jump around a little bit. And the reason is 
um, I like to modify the class so that we are using the shop uh, in an efficient manner. So I know we kind of talked about that for those of you who are in the lab last week. So we do have a couple of tasks. It's in that chapter 14 um, and 15 uh, lab work uh, module that's on Canvas. So here we go. Um, so here are the objectives. We want to know all of the all of the uh, functions of the engine oil and, and what it's made up of. We want to know what are the additives that get put in the engine oil and the different types of oil. We also want to know who are the certifying bodies? What is a certifying body? How come when we put oil into our you know, very expensive engine, how do we know that's good oil? And then we're going to be able to identify uh, and describe the purpose of lubrication system components, uh, describe wet sump and dry sump systems. Okay? Uh, identify, describe the purpose of the pickup tube, oil pumps, pressure relief valves, oil filters, spurt holes and oil galleries, as well as oil coolers and oil indicators. We'll learn about oil monitoring systems. Uh, like we said before, different types of lubrication systems, dry sump, wet sump, pressure fed lubrication systems, splash lubrication systems, two stroke lubrication systems, and uh, two-stroke oil injection. Um, so here we go. Lubrication keeps the parts moving from wearing out quickly. So what is the component we're looking at here? Can anybody tell me? The camshaft? Yeah, exactly. This is a camshaft. It's installed inside of the cylinder head. Um, and if you look, uh, you could see the valve adjusters where you see like the nut with then the screw in the middle with a slot. Can you guys see my cursor on the screen? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yes. So you see, so, so here's an adjustment nut, adjustment nut, and then that adjustment nut goes into this part of the cylinder head. Inside of there uh, is solid. And then this is called a lash adjuster. Lash is the free space between the valve and the rocker arm. This rocker arm goes across, <clears throat> the camshaft load pushes on the middle, and then on the other side of the rocker arm, it pushes down to open the valve, okay? Um, so this is considered internal engine. Uh, one of the things that I like to explain is the oil is kind of a cushion between the moving parts. So technically, as these parts are rotating and working and we have proper oil pressure, there should always be a layer of oil in between the parts. So we never really have metal to metal contact. Um, and what happens when we get metal to metal contact? Uh, it gets rust. Uh, rust is going to be caused by moisture, but what happens when the metal parts in the engine uh, touch each other? Okay, Salvador says scoring, Joshua says friction and heat. Those are, those are all true. Um, ultimately, the, the word I'm looking for is wear, W-E-A-R, right? The engine's going to wear out. Every time those metal components rub each other, it's causing wear. Every time your shoes touch the ground, it wears rubber off of them. Every time the metal components in an engine touch each other, it wears metal off of them. So the purpose of oil is to create a cushion between those moving parts so that they do not wear out prematurely. Okay. Um, let's see here. Crude oil comes from where, class? Where does oil come from? All right, Joshua says the ground. You're correct, Joshua, right? So, so we, uh, from fossils, uh, that's right. So, we pull oil from the ground by drilling holes into it, right? So if you've ever driven through Bakersfield 
If you've been in Santa Barbara and you look out into the ocean, you see these big giant things on the water that look like buildings. Those are all oil, oil wells. And what we do is we pump the oil out of the ground. And then we take that oil and we refine it into something that we call gasoline or grease or diesel fuel. Um, so we use a distilling process. Who knows what distilled distilling process is? It's like uh, cleaning the, the crude oil. From... It, uh, it cleans the crude oil, right? And what other industry or what other products do we use the distilling process? Uh, I think kind of also like with the, uh, like with the water, like the recycling process of the water. Yeah, we can distill water, alcohol. Thank you, Salvador. Joshua, thank you. Right. Anybody ever hear of the word moonshine? No, no. What? Yeah. Well, can you wait say a minute. You guys are car guys and you haven't heard of moonshine? <laughs> yeah. Moonshine, that's the, that's the reason NASCAR exists is because of moonshine, right? So, so moonshine, um, uh, distilled water, uh, crude oil, these all get distilled. So the distilling process is a process where you heat up the crude material and that crude material evaporates and you capture the vapors and you condense those vapors back into a liquid and then all the solids get left behind. And then the pure liquid that you want gets condensed into uh, a container. So the distilling process in oil leaves behind heavy greases um, and things like that, greases and tar. Um, and then the really fine stuff ends up being natural gas, gasoline, propane. And then we start getting into diesel fuels and jet fuels. Um, so <clears throat> let's see, uh, thickening agents are added to the base and stocks are used as lubricating grease and bearings. Okay, so, so the, when we distill the oil, let's see if there's a picture on the next slide here. No, there's not a picture. I need to add a picture that, you know, in your book, there might be a picture of uh, the distilling process where they show like an oil refinery, where they actually distill the oil. And, and, and when the oil separates, it separates into different layers. And in, in each one of those layers, you get a different material for different purposes. Okay, here's an example of the layer of oil I was talking about between the moving parts. So the clearance is filled with lubricating oil so that the engine parts move uh, or float on layers of oil instead of directly on each other. Okay, so, so if the engine is not functioning properly and it squeezes that oil out, or if there's not enough oil pressure, then those two components are gonna be rubbing on each other, okay? Here's some other uh, benefits of the engine oil. They keep the engine cool. They collect heat from the components, right? So as cool oil splashes on the moving parts inside the engine, that cool oil is gonna absorb the heat from those moving parts, okay? And then it takes that heat down into the oil pan. In the oil pan, the oil gets to cool off because as you're driving, air blows across the oil pan and then the hot oil mixes with the cool oil uh, and then the process starts over. Uh, oil also includes what they call detergents. Detergents are additives that are put into the oil to help clean the parts. Who's heard of oil sludging? No. No? I have. You've heard of oil sludging? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. I need to show you guys a couple of things. Let me pull this up here. Uh,
I'm just trying to pull up a couple of images here that kind of show show what we've been talking about. Oh, here we go. Let's see. So this is the oil uh, distillation process or or um, oil refining process. So what happens is we pump this oil into a refinery and this oil goes through this process. So um, we pump in crude oil, we heat it up and then that crude oil separates and it breaks up into gases. This is liquefied, liquefied petroleum gas. This is gasoline. Um, then we end up with chemicals, um, different chemicals, lighter fluid, okay? Uh, this is the, or the type of fluid that they soak in, uh, in charcoal, okay? Petrol gasoline, excuse me, this, here's the gasoline. This is your uh, LPG. This is propane gas at the top, okay? Uh, petrol for vehicles. Then we end up with kerosene, which runs jet fuel or, um, or heating elements. Then diesel fuels, which run trains and, and vehicles that run on diesel, after diesel fuel, we get into lubricating oils, transmission fluid, engine oil, um, uh, gear oils, okay? And then we have fuel oil, which is very, very uh, cru uh, crude. It's very thick, heavy, nasty oil, um, which they use in container ships. In the industrial process, they burn it. Uh, and then the last thing is residue. So this is bitumen used for roads and roofing. So this is tar pretty much at the bottom, okay? So that's the process for distilling or refining oil. Okay? Are there any questions about that process? Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. So when we, re the refining process is when uh, we boil, it's like the vapors from the crude oil. That's where uh, the, the gasoline comes from, right? Yeah, so you see, so, so we pump the oil from the ground and then see on the left side of here, it says crude oil. Yeah. We push that crude oil through a boiler right here. See this thing here has flames, right? Yeah. So you heat up that crude oil and then it goes into this big separator. They call it here in this diagram, they call it a fractionating um, column. column, all right? So it goes through and then see these little valves help separate the, the fuel based on its viscosity, right? Because down here at the very bottom, this is thick, tar, sticky, nasty stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the top is very thin liquid fuel like propane. Yeah. Right? So it separates it and then they use all the different types of fuels in between for all different processes. All right. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yep. Very good. Anybody else? All right. So there's one more thing I wanted to show you here. I want to leave that diagram up because I think that's a good one. See if I can load that into the PowerPoint here. All right, so the next thing I was going to show you is uh, sludge. Uh, oil sludge in engine. Search. All right, so sometimes you're going to open an engine. Let's see if I can get this diagram to open properly. Sometimes you're going to open an engine and you're going to see colors that look like this. And if you look closely, it almost looks like there's mud caked onto the parts. Can you guys see that? Yep. That is sludge. So sludge happens when the additives from the engine oil are no longer, produce, are, are no longer able to do their job. How could the additives from the engine oil not be able to do their jobs? 
because the oil is already wear, like they don't do their oil changes uh, frequently. Exactly, exactly. So this is what happens if the oil doesn't get changed at the proper uh, interval, okay? <clears throat> so that oil starts to break down and attach itself to the moving parts. And then what will happen is a, a big chunk of this oil will fall off, fall to the oil pan and plug up the oil pickup tube, and then it'll starve the engine of oil. And that's how we get engine failure, okay? The other problem is if you have an engine like this, how do you get that out? There is no way to get that out of there, right? So it's imminent engine failure is really uh, what ends up happening when you don't change your oil. Questions on the oil sludge? Well, they have like uh, engine flush kits that kind of break that down. Well, there gets a point where the sludge is so bad that no flush kit is going to save the engine. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I know there's some shops have like these fancy machines where you like back flush the oil system. That's not going to get the sludge off the bottom of the valve cover. That might get some of the sludge out of the oil pan and, you know, help clean the pickup tube. But the problem with those is now that we flush the engine, we may have loosened up something that could cause problems later. So fl the flush machines are not really um, advisable, at least my, my expert opinion. I, I prefer not to use a sludge, uh, excuse me, uh, a flush machine on the engine oil system. Um, the best way to prevent this is doing oil changes when you're supposed to do oil changes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Uh, professor? Yes, sir. Have you heard the word uh, on the uh, when mechanics say uh, mil milky uh, oil? Like it's like like if it, it was like chocolate milk. Yes. You want to see what that looks like? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, and you guys can Google this too. You know, you, I don't have to show you. Um, so one of the signs, sometimes you'll open a, um, you'll open the oil cap and you might see something that looks like this. You see that there? Yeah. You open it and then it looks like kind of like a milkshake in there, kind of like, um, you know, it's not oil and it's not water, but this is a sign that there is moisture in the system. Uh, here's another one that's in the radiator. There's oil in the water. Okay. Uh, and then there was a great diagram. Did I lose it already? Oh, here we go. So on the dipstick, you can see this one's clean oil, normal oil. Okay. And then down below, you see how it looks like milkshake. Yeah. That is an indication that there's water that has mixed with the oil. Okay. Now, as a technician, it's important. Here's what it would look like in a pan if you drained it. Okay, so there's like trace, traces of water, okay? As a technician, you have to determine if you have milkshake oil, why do we have milkshake oil? Sometimes the car doesn't get driven enough, so the moisture that's in the oil is just simply condensation from the car that gets parked. You know, if you have an old lady and she drives two miles to the Trader Joe's every, uh, you know, once a week. Is that enough mileage to, to get the engine hot enough to burn off any moisture that is accumulated in the oil? Does, does driving two miles heat up the engine to normal operating temperature? No. 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 So what, what could happen is she drives it two miles right? It's not quite nor, uh, hot enough to burn off any moisture, but it's not quite, but it is warm enough to condensate inside the engine when she parks. So when we condensate, that means moisture from the air that's in the engine block um, will 
form little water droplets and those water droplets can, can mix with the oil and cause some of this. But you know, all the pictures you're seeing here are usually um, because you got a failed head gasket, you might have a radiator or oil cooler that has failed, okay? So it's not, um, it's not really good to see, to see this when you pull an oil cap and you look and you see that, you know, it's a good idea to, uh, to, to, to spend a little time. You see, it says possible blown head gasket. I remember on the, when I worked on Jeeps on the 4.7 liter V8s, once in a while you'd pull off a cap um, and it would have some of this, not quite that much. Um, and it would be like that because the vehicle didn't get driven enough. The, 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 uh, the vehicle would usually have low miles. So it's not enough uh, heat to really burn off the moisture in the oil system. So did I answer your question, Elias? Yeah, thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Anybody else? Let's see here. All right, let's jump back to my slideshow here. <clears throat> all right, can you all still see my slideshow okay? Yeah, very good. All right, so the lubricating oil also uh, can help seal the piston rings. Now you all, most of you have done the uh, wet compression test, right? Yes. In the wet compression test, the oil uh, creates a temporary seal around the piston rings, uh, which allows those piston rings to uh, produce pressure in the combustion chamber. So, um, so that's very important to make sure we're changing our oil on a regular basis, so those rings stay nice and clean, clean, and they and they're able to move freely, um, so we can get oil in and out of those ring ring grooves. Okay. Um, one of the things about oil is one of its properties is viscosity. Um, so this diagram says A, oil with uh, high viscosity is relatively thick. Oil with low viscosity is relatively thin. Um, I like to explain it like, uh, like uh, syrup. Anybody put syrup on their pancakes or their crepes? Yep. If that syrup is cold and you try to pour it from the bottle, how does it come out? It comes thick, right? It comes out thick and slow, right? When it comes out thick and slow, that means it's a high viscosity liquid. But if we heat up the syrup and we go to pour it, how does it come out? Thin comes out fast, right? It's thin. It flows really easy. So viscosity is the liquid's ability to flow or its resistance to flow. So the higher the viscosity, the thicker the liquid. It flows, um, the, 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 the flow is much slower with a high viscosity liquid, okay? Um, thinner oil flows more easily, reducing drag and increasing fuel economy. Thicker oil um, is going to uh, provide a little more uh, protection, okay? But you can't really have both because if it's too thin, you can cause engine damage. So besides viscosity, some of the other things that we have in oil, like I mentioned before, uh, uh, oils have additives. Um, so there's extreme pressure additives, oxidation inhibitors, um, corrosion inhibitors, anti-foam agents, detergents. What's a dispersant? Anybody? No, that's okay. A dispersant is um, the property of the oil. If you have detergents, Right, those detergents are going to clean the inside of the engine. I hope I didn't lose somebody here. Let's see here. 
If you have detergents, those detergents clean the inside of the engine as, as, the, as the oil's uh, moving around in there. Um, if that oil, if, excuse me, if that detergent grabs a molecule, a, a dirt molecule or something, um, the dispersants, what they do is the dispersants kind of cover that, um, that contaminant uh, with a layer that's going to prevent that contaminant to attaching itself uh, back to the engine, okay? Uh, do they have metal particles in the oil? They keep the metal, well, they keep the, the, the foreign object or they keep the, the contaminants in the oil. So what it does, the dispersant helps suspend the contaminants in the oil so that those contaminants do not attach to the engine block, the oil pan, the connecting rods, the pistons, the crankshaft, the camshaft, or any of the other components in the engine. So the dispersants, um, vi visualize this, when you wash your laundry, right? If you get a, a ketchup stain on your shirt, you know, the detergent's gonna clean it off. What keeps that ketchup from staining the other clothes or transferring to the other clothes um, what keeps that from happening is dispersants. Dispersants kind of build a, a layer of protection around that contaminant to prevent it from, from, from attaching itself to something else, okay? Questions on that? And then we have pore point depressants and viscosity index improvers, okay? So these are all different types of additives that get put in the oils. So when people say, what's the difference between Mobile One and Castrol GTX full synthetic? Um, really the difference is the formula of additives and what they use as additives uh, in their oils. That's the only difference, okay? Uh, conventional oil gets pumped from the ground. Crude is broken down into mineral oil, which is then combined with additives to enhance lubricating qualities. That's what we've been talking about, okay? Um, type three is not a true synthetic. Type four, true synthetic oils based on artificially made hydrocarbons. Um, let's see. I do not have the answer to how synthetic oil is made. Um, I imagine it's made in a lab using exactly like we see here, um, artificially made hydrocarbons. Uh, I imagine that there's probably corn involved somehow. Um, thinner, better, low temperature viscosity, chemically more stable. They offer better protection against engine wear. Mineral oils, highly refined base stock, refined from crude oil. I personally use synthetic oil in, in, in everything. Um, the cost of synthetic oil is not too much more compared to uh, conventional oil. Most modern cars uh, specify synthetic oil for their, for, for, for um, the manufacturers are specifying synthetic oil for, for their regular maintenance. Um, even in my generators, you know, I have a little side business. All of my generators, I just use synthetic oil in my generators as well. Um, I think the peace of mind of not having to change your oil every 3,000 miles is worth the, the few extra dollars of synthetic oil. So like it says, the, the, the advantages are the che it's chemically more stable. So if you see the chemical composition of synthetic oil versus crude oil, um, you know, I don't have an image of it. But um, it, re it really, you could see the stability of the, of the oil, uh, which is what allows it to last much longer, okay? Uh, when you watch the Motor Oil 101 um, training lesson on SP2 website, uh, they're gonna show you what that molecular structure looks like. Okay. Um, I had a question about regarding like the synthetic and the conventional oil. Go ahead. Um, so I know there's this uh, belief that um, if you have a vehicle that has over 150,000 miles, it's recommended to use a conventional without mileage. But you were saying that you use synthetic oil on anything. So would it be okay to put a synthetic oil on a high mileage vehicle, 
even yeah, though it's a conventional? I, I think so. You know, I, 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 there's a lot of myths about synthetic oil. And one of the, um, one of the myths that I've never found to be true is that synthetic oil, if you switch from conventional to synthetic on a high mileage vehicle, um, that it could cause oil leaks. Um, I've never seen that happen. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've switched lots of cars and I've never seen it happen. So, so it's, it's hard to say for sure. Um, the best way to find out guys. So, so I'm going to backpedal a little bit, uh, not backpedal, but back up a little bit and talk about just my personal philosophy. I I've never, uh, when I work on a customer's car, I don't sell, uh, the snake oil, if you will. I don't sell like, you know, the more expensive fluid that comes with reward points so that I can get extra money. I don't sell um, extra flush because it makes the shop more money. Um, I don't believe in those things unless I have proven that they actually make the vehicle work better and, and it's actually a benefit for the customer. Um, so if I haven't personally tested it on my own cars and, and enjoyed a, a, a better uh, experience for my machine, um, I, I, I won't use it. So I have switched from conventional oil to synthetic oil, and I notice a smoother running engine, cooler temperatures, and, um, and better longevity. I was running synthetic oil in my 2001 Jeep Grand Cherokee when I sold it. Excuse me. When I sold it, it had 300,000 miles on it. And um, at, at 300,000 miles, a piston actually failed, which was common for those. So I put a new piston in it. No, I put all new pistons in it. I pulled the head off, dropped the oil pan, put all new pistons. While I had the oil pan off, I took off every main, all the bearings. And I looked at the bearings. All the bearings looked brand new. It had 300,000 miles. and um, the internal components, there was no like discoloring. All the color was really nice. Uh, the inside of the engine, you couldn't tell that it was 300,000 miles because I ran synthetic oil. The piston cracked because it was a poor design by Jeep. Um, but using synthetic oil in my experience has been good. Um, switching from conventional to synthetic um, I sh shouldn't hurt. Going from synthetic to conventional could affect the per performance. You might notice a difference. The engine might feel more sluggish, might not feel as crisp. Um, some of the emissions systems are not really designed to work with conventional oils. So it's really important that you use oil that is that meets the um, meets the certification standard that the manufacturer recommends. And we'll talk more about that. And the Motor Oil 101 course will also discuss that. So, um, the, Elias, did I answer your question? Uh, that was actually my question, but yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, I'm sorry. I jumped around a little bit because I, I think it's really important as you guys are coming into the world as, as young technicians, like it's really nice to sell, sell the flushes and make the money uh, and, 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 and feel like you're doing something good for the customer. But I would always advise, you know, try it on your own car first and see if you even notice a difference. Also learn what does the manufacturer recommend, right? So the manufacturers are not spending millions of dollars engineering these cars and, and, and writing service manuals so that you can experiment with a, with a machine that some third party company is trying to make a quick buck on. I, ho I hope that makes sense. There are synthetic blend oils, okay? So this is the next thing that they're, they're, we're talking about here in the slideshow. The synthetic blend oil is a mixture of um, conventional oil and synthetic oil. These are recommended. Let's say you do have a vehicle, you've always run conventional oil and you wanna switch. You might wanna switch to a synthetic blend first to see if, that, if you notice a difference. Um, the recommendation here in this slide is saying uh, it's better for when you're, uh, the vehicle's used hard for hauling or towing, okay? Okay, so here are the certifying bodies. So we have API, 
is the American Petroleum Institute. SAE is the Society of Automotive Engineers. Those are the two you will probably most commonly see here in the United States. ILSAC is the International Lubrication Standards Association Certification, something like that. Uh, we'll, we'll probably see it in the slideshow here in a minute. Um, so ILSAC does more of the uh, import cars. And then the other ones are JSO, which is uh, Japan, ACEA and OEM, I'm not 100% familiar with. Um, so when you see this donut, this is called the API donut. When you see this on, uh, on your oil bottle, okay, what that means is this oil has been certified by the American Petroleum Institute. So if we look closely at the text on this slide, it sets the minimum performance standard for the lubricant. Okay, so the minimum performance standard, if you look up here on the top right of the donut, it says SN. If you look in your owner's manual, there will probably be um, a minimum standard for the oil you can use in that car. So uh, SN stands, the S stands for spark ignition. Okay, uh, if it's a diesel oil, it's gonna have a C, so it'll be like a CN. Um, so, so the S stands for spark ignition, C stands for compression ignition. The N is the generation of the oil, right? So before N was O, M, N, O, M, not O. So uh, M, and then the next generation of oil was N. And then the next one after N will be O, okay? So that's how we can certify the oil for different vehicles. So my wife's car uses like the latest one, which I think is SN or SM. Um, but if I look in like my Jeep owner's manual, it was like SL, right? So L, M, N, O. So it was like a few generations before. Um, so, so if you're using a newer oil, the newer oils always um, supersede the old oils, meaning that you can use this newer oil in an older car, but you cannot use an older oil in a newer car. Did I say that clearly? Yeah. Very good, all right. Uh, so S is spark ignition, C is compression ignition. The API symbol is located on the back of the bottle. Um, and then uh, the ILSAC performance rating and energy conserving designation, right? Right. So it says resource conserving here. And then SAE, the so Society Auto Automotive Engineers, they're saying that in winter temperatures, the viscosity of this oil is a zero. And in summer temperatures, the viscosity of this oil is a 20, okay? So how can we make an oil have a, a, a less viscosity when it's cold and more viscosity when it's hot? That's the opposite of the natural tendency of oil. Who can explain that? Anybody want to take a guess at how we do that? Can you repeat the question again? So <clears throat> the SAE rating on this example shows a zero W20. So the viscosity rating in winter weather is a zero, meaning very low, uh, very low, uh, high viscosity, meaning the oil flows very fast in the winter. And then a 20 for summer, meaning it gets thicker in summer weather. You with me? Yeah. So, so how do we get oil that is thinner in the cold weather and thicker in the hot weather? How do we make that happen? Anybody want to take a guess? Additives? Yes, 
And then does anybody know what kind of additive specifically they use for that? Or anybody want to take a guess? No idea. <laughs> Has anybody ever played with those little Orbeez? Let's see if I can find Orbeez and I'll share with you. Yeah, I think my friend ate one. Your friend ate one? <laughs> yeah, in elementary school. <laughs> That's funny. Let's see if I can find an Orby real quick and I'll show you guys uh, what I'm talking about. All right, so let me share my screen. Orbeez are these things here. Okay, there's these little polymer beads, but then when you put them in liquid, they absorb that liquid and then they get bigger. You guys see that? Okay, so that's an Orby that's absorbed liquid. They come in a container like this where they're just little tiny beads. Okay, so the little tiny bead is small like a grain of rice. But then when you put it in liquid, it absorbs the liquid and it gets big like that first uh, image that I shared with you, okay? Um, so Orbeez are a type of polymer. So what happens in engine oil is they put these polymers in there and as the oil gets hotter, the polymers expand helping to increase the viscosity of the oil, okay? So when you're watching that, um, <clears throat> when you're watching that video on, the, for the Motor Oil 101 course, they'll explain a little more about how that works. All right, so the API classification, you have a group one, is produced by simple distillation of crude oil, Groups two, three, four include full synthetic uh, oils. Group five includes other types of synthetic oil. Groups two and three are refined with hydrogen at much higher temperatures and pressures, a process known as hydro cracking. Okay, hydrogenating newer process of removing impurities. Uh, so, so by using the hydrogen, it can remove the impurities from this man-made oil. Okay, so the classifications here are groups one, two, three, four, and five. Um, sorry about that. Uh, personally, guys, I've never used these classifications. I mainly look at the API logo um, to identify if the oil meets the minimum requirements recommended in my owner's manual. Questions before I move on? All right, uh, moving on into viscosities here. Uh, they're explaining here that the lower viscosity rating, a zero, oh shoot, what did I do? Here we go, uh, zero W, five W or 10 W, those are tested at zero degrees Fahrenheit. And then the higher viscosity ratings, 20, 30, 40 and 50, they're tested at 210 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Um, modern oils are classified by two-part designation, SAE 0W20, um, and then the new high temperature viscosity grades, SAE 16, 12, and 8. These are high temperature viscosity grades. I haven't seen those yet uh, in my experience. I think some of these newer vehicles uh, might start using some of this stuff. I'm not sure exactly what type of engines, but I did hear about this vaguely. Um, how they're switching to some of these other types of oils. And the idea of these other types of oils are to increase fuel economy. The engine has to work really hard to move the rotating parts in the engine when we add oil in there, right? Visualize yourself swimming through water and then visualize yourself swimming through syrup. If you're swimming through syrup, that's going to be a little more work. Do you agree? Yes. 
Absolutely, right? Swimming through water is going to be a lot easier. So by changing the viscosity grades of these oils, the engine has to work, um, doesn't have to work as hard to, pr to do the same amount of work uh, therefore increasing fuel efficiency, very important. The International Lubricants Standardization and Approval Committee, ILSAC, um, they work in conjunction with API to create new specifications. Um, and then they issue sequentially higher rating levels when standards are changed. Currently we're at a GF5, right? So like my Volkswagen, uh, Passat is a diesel, and I think it uses like a GF5 oil uh, for the engine. Um, the next ILSAC standard will be a GF6, it says. So as long as your vehicle is using uh, the minimum requirement or newer oil, you should be safe. That's essentially what they're saying there. The ACEA, okay, this is the Association des Constructeurs European. This is if you have a BMW, a Volkswagen. I used this Pento uh, oil on my Volkswagen uh, last time I did an oil change. Um, I don't know if I like it, but, um, but I tried it. I think I like the uh, Castrol that I was using before. Um, but let's see. The ACEA rated oil scores high on soot thickening, water sludge, piston deposits, oxidative thickening, fuel economy, and after treatment capability. So this is supposed to be better for diesel engines um, according to this slide here. Okay, so those are just different organizations. Then you have JSO, which is a Japanese automotive standards organization. So again, they have their own classifications. Uh, if you look here on the diagram, you'll see most labels will say that it meets API service for CJ4, CI4, plus CH4, CG4, CF4, CF, SM. So SM stands for spark ignition M service. CF start, stands for compression ignition F service. Okay, so this oil could be used in diesel or gasoline engines. Um, and it meets the all of these minimum qualifications here. Questions? All right, OEM specific standards. So if you look here, uh, this one has Dexos. Dexos is um, an OEM standard uh, that's used by General Motors, okay? So specific to individual manufacturers or individual engines of a particular manufacturer. Um, so that's Dexos. Let's see where we're at here. Do I still have everyone's attention? Yep. All right, sorry Oops. guys, we're, we're going long. Um, but I want to make sure I cover all of this stuff. Uh, if there are any questions, please interrupt me. In, in fact, uh, you guys ready for a five minute stretch real quick? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Let's do a five minute stretch. I'll see you guys back here at 741. Sound good? Yeah, yeah. Let's do a five minute stretch. That's kind of a long run we've done so far. So I'll see you guys back in five minutes.
All right, guys, I am back. Anybody need another minute? All right, well, who's here? Ready. All here. right, all right. Very good, very good. Hopefully you got to stand up and stretch. I think only three of you guys are here. Everybody else is just logged in. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna go for it. Awesome. Thank you for those of you who are here. So here we go. Let's jump back into the slideshow. And uh, there's not too many more slides, but I wanna make sure that we cover this, um, you know, as best we can, of course. So this is a lubrication system. This would be your traditional four cylinder engine. Okay, and it kind of shows each component here. So at the bottom, you see the pink, that's your oil. Uh, the oil gets picked up from a strainer. Uh, the oil pump is what produces the suction to draw the oil into the oiling system. It pushes, thanks Andy. It pushes the oil from the pump into the filter. Um, let's see, depending on the system, it's either gonna push through the filter or suck through the filter. And then the pump pushes the oil into a main oil gallery in a cylinder head oil gallery on this diagram. And then in the engine, there's a series of holes that are drilled into the block and cylinder head. Those holes, um, if you follow the path, end up at the rotating components. In this diagram, the rot rotating components are the camshaft on the top, and on the bottom, it's the, uh, it's the crankshaft main bearing. So if you look in the crankshaft, it looks like there's four sticks just kind of randomly placed in there. Do you guys see those? Yep. So what that is, the main bearings have holes. The oil from the engine block goes into the main bearing journals of the crankshaft to lubricate the crankshaft as it rotates around. There's also a hole that is drilled from the big connecting rod end or the connecting rod journal all the way through to the main journal of the crank. So that pink stick is actually a hole that's drilled into the crankshaft so that the crankshaft can provide oil to the connecting rod, okay? So when we have, when we get back in the lab and you guys ask me, I actually have a crankshaft that I can demonstrate. I, I take a crankshaft and I get a piece of wire and I stick it through the crankshaft and you can see how all of these oil galleries move through the crankshaft, which is pretty fascinating considering the crankshaft is a moving part and it has all these little pathways in it. Um, so that's something that we can definitely share. Okay, any questions on this slide before I move on? All right, very good, moving on, I think. There we go. So wet drum and dry sump system. So this is a wet sump. Um, so this picture is essentially the same as the last picture we saw. There's a couple small differences. Um, one of the differences is we're looking at the engine from the front instead of the side. Um, you can see your pickup tube there. Um, the oil pan they're referring to as a sump, a sump plug. Um, and then that oil pump pulls oil from the sump and pushes it through the filter. From the filter, it goes to the oil pressure sender. Do you guys see that little oil pressure sender? Yeah. Essentially what that sender is, it's a switch. So when that switch is in the closed position, it actually completes a path for the electricity to flow and turn on the oil pressure warning light. When you start the engine, the oil pressure actually pushes that switch open. It breaks the contact for the oil pressure light and the light goes out. So when the engine is running, the oil light should be out. That would indicate that you have good oil pressure. 
Um, then you can see there's a main oil gallery and then the oil supply to the camshaft. This is essentially the same diagram we saw in the last slide. This is a wet sump, meaning there's always oil in the sump and the pickup tube is in the sump, okay? One of the challenges with this system is when you're driving around, can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Thank you. When you're driving around, okay, the oil from the engine that's already been used drops into the sump, that's normal. But if you make a hard turn, you brake or accelerate quickly, that oil is gonna splash. When that oil splashes and it makes contact with the crank, two things happen. The crankshaft is uh, wasting energy because it has to push through the oil. The second thing that happens is as the crankshaft smacks the oil, it introduces air and it can aerate the oil, essentially causing the oil to foam. Um, so that's actually kind of a bad, bad thing for our engines. So the next system we have here, and this system is mostly found on performance engines. I know Porsche uses this on some of, uh, on most of their cars. Um, and then like, if you have a Ferrari or Lamborghini, it will probably also have this type of system. This is a dry sump system. Um, so it, it's used in applications where ground clearance or extra capacity is needed, and it uses shallow oil collection. So besides the ground clearance, um, in this type of system, the oil's never really going to come in contact with the rotating crank. So if you're doing hard, aggressive turns, aggressive stops, aggressive acceleration, you don't have this oil sloshing around, um, potentially causing problems inside the engine. So you could see that from this oil pan here, the oil just kind of runs into an oil strainer. It goes into the scavenge pump. So the scavenge pump is kind of in line and it draws the oil from the strainer, pushes it through an oil cooler, okay? Um, and then as it goes through that cooler, it enters uh, the oil tank. That oil tank uh, would takes the place of your sump. From the oil tank, you have a pickup area where it, where the where the main pressure pump draws oil, um, not air, just oil, and pressurizes that oil, pushes it through the filter, and then lubricates the internal engine components. Okay, so this is your dry sump system. Are there any questions about the dry sump? The dry sump is definitely more complicated. So um, you have two pumps, an oil cooler, and a sump, or excuse me, an oil tank. Um, so here on a wet sump and dry sump uh, explanation, uh, so on a regular engine, you have an oil pan with a drain plug. You can drain it out. Um, that's a pretty shallow oil pan, uh, but all engines are designed differently. Uh, this here, this tray is called a windage tray. So that is found in, in you know, several types of engines. The idea is if the oil does slosh, this windage tray kind of holds the oil uh, down to prevent the oil from splashing into the crankshaft, okay? So that's the purpose of the windage tray. A lot of old hot rodders use windage trays in their big V8 engines to produce, um, it helps produce power because you don't have this oil touching the crankshaft, okay? That windage tray helps separate it. It allows oil to drain back into the pan, but not splash into the crank. And then the bottom image is an oil pan with baffles to keep oil near the pickup screen. Uh, so the baffles help with sloshing and help keep the oil where it needs to be so that the oil pump can always draw in clean, fresh oil. So the pickup tube, uh, in this diagram, it's a small pickup tube. Uh, so the, the, the purpose of the pickup tube is to pull oil from the sump. Um, the oil pump creates suction, um, and that suction moves through the pickup tube uh, to draw oil in through the pickup screen. 
So if you look closely inside the little hole here, you'll see like a little screen. And that screen is actually like a pre-filter to prevent any large debris from getting sucked up into the oil pump. Um, but you could see if you had sludge, that little uh, screen could get plugged up really easily. That's just a small opening. So it's real important to prevent your engines from slud uh, sludging up. Okay. Questions? Please hop in guys if anything comes up, okay? Uh, there's a couple types of oil pumps. So this oil pump is a rotor type oil pump. Uh, so you'll see there as it rotates, it creates a large area. Uh, and from that large area, it pushes oil into a smaller area producing pressure. Um, the inner rotor drives the outer one and the oil is forced out of the pump inlet. So not only does the star in the middle rotate, but this uh, housing, this is the housing on the outside. Then in the middle, there's a, a, a outside gear and, it, and then this is the internal gear. Uh, these kind of rotate together to produce that oil pressure uh, phenomenon. A geared oil pump is when we have two gears working together to produce oil pressure. So they take that oil, push it around a housing, and uh, as those gears meet on the other side, it produces a high pressure oil area. Uh, and then there's the crescent pump, which is again, uh, internal gear and external gear. And this one has this crescent style uh, wedge in there. Uh, and what happens is as we rotate the uh, gear, it pushes oil past that crescent uh, and that produces oil pressure which gets pushed into the engine on the purple tube here. Questions on that? So you have a rotary style oil pump, a gear style, and a crescent pump. Okay, the oil pressure relief valve. Who can tell me what they think the pressure relief valve does? It relieves pressure. <laughs> it does relieve pressure, right? But what would be some conditions when we wanna release the pressure from the oil system? When we have high load on the engine. Right, so when the engine's at high RPM, the oil pump's gonna be rotating faster, producing higher pressures than the engine may need, right? So if we put full pressure into the engine, we could actually blow head gaskets and blow out seals, um, causing problems, uh, engine problems. Uh, so what we wanna do is we wanna release that pressure and dump that oil right back into the oil pan. Um, so you can see here's the oil pressure relief valve. Uh, let's see here, high leakage, high volume, low volume. So that relief valve will actually open when the uh, oil pressure exceeds a certain certain amount. In cold weather, the oil pressure, the oil is going to be uh, a little harder to push through and could produce higher pressures than normal. Um, so uh, that pressure relief valve might help during cold weather starts as well. Uh, so here you can see kind of an example, uh, low relief valve flow on top, low pump speed. Uh, as the vehicle speeds up, you're driving down the highway, high pump speeds, um, that pressure relief valve opens and it's gonna release the pressure that's not needed by the engine, okay? And you can see as the flow changes at the relief valve, the oil pressure stays the same. So the idea is to maintain a consistent pressure from the engine oil. Oil filters. So oil filters, there's a couple types. You have full flow filters, okay? That's image A. A full flow oil filter. Um, 
allows oil to move through that filter uh, uninterrupted until that filter plugs, okay? Um, the other style is a bypass filter. So the image on the right shows a bypass filter. So what happens is if that bypass filter plugs up, there's actually a bypass valve inside the filter, which allows the oil to go around the filter element and, and continue to lubricate the engine anyways. So by using that method, you reduce the chance of starving the engine for oil. Questions about that? Uh, the most common type of filter is the one on top. This is a spin-on filter. It comes with an O-ring, an O-ring style gasket. Um, for anybody who's done an oil change, you're probably very familiar with that. Uh, square cut rubber O-rings fit into a groove in the base of the filter. They seal the base of the filter to the engine block. The cartridge paper filter is um, a lot of a lot of cars are switching to this. Uh, this is a paper element filter. We actually have to open a housing. Um, and then once you have the housing open, you can switch out the element and put the housing back together. Spurt holes. Any questions on filters before we talk about spurt holes? All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, so a spurt hole, if you see on the side of the connecting rod here, um, the connecting rod has a hole drilled into it, and that hole is, is, um, is bored out up to the side of the connecting rod. So as that piston reciprocates up and down in the cylinder, that spurt hole is actually squirting oil onto the cylinder wall so that as the piston moves back down into the um, cylinder, uh, it lubricates the rings, okay? So um, some of those spurt holes are designed to spray into the bottom of the piston to keep the piston cool and lubricate the rings that way. Um, some spurt holes just spray on the cylinder wall. Uh, in the slide here, the second bullet point says that there are also spurt holes that lubricate the timing chain and the timing mechanism for engines that use a timing chain. Uh, heavy duty engines have oil nozzles that spray oil onto the bottom of the piston. Oil's fed to the cylinder head through oil galleries and onto the camshaft bearings and valve train. Questions on spurt holes and oil galleries. Moving on. Okay, just stop me guys if I'm going too fast, please. Oil coolers work very similar to radiators. Um, we're gonna push hot oil in. As air moves across the fins of the oil cooler, it removes heat from the oil. And as that oil cycles back into the engine, the oil cools off, okay? Very simple oil to air cooler. The diagram on the left is, uh, it looks kind of like a genie lamp with a little droplet of oil coming off the tip there. That is a low oil pressure warning light. If you see that light on your car, that is bad. That means you need to either add oil or fix the reason why you don't have oil pressure, okay? Uh, diagram B says register on a gauge. Uh, so some of you have oil pressure gauges on your vehicles, uh, this is what it looks like. That should show you the approximate oil pressure of the uh, engine uh, lubrication system. If that is showing zero or near zero, that could be a problem. Um, and then on the right, there's actually a digital display that says check engine oil pressure, okay? So those are the most common style warning lights, warning systems that we have for oil pressure. Each one of these uses a very similar sensing device. Like I said before, we have a switch that will open when there's oil pressure so the light goes out. When the oil pressure goes away, the switch closes. 
the light comes back on. Um, the style in the center where it has a gauge actually uses a pressure transducer, um, which is a um, sensor that has a, a mechanism with a diaphragm that uh, as the diaphragm moves uh, further or closer actually changes the voltage um, of the uh, amount of voltage that's going to the gauge. And that's how the gauge knows how much pressure. Uh, in the olden days, we actually had a very thin, small plastic tube that's screwed into an oil gallery. And then when you'd start the engine, oil would go through that plastic tube and that needle was mechanical. There's actually oil pressure that pushed on a diaphragm that moved the needle, okay? That's very old school. The danger with that is if something ca catches fire under the hood, the engine oil can become a fuel and then the fire can travel up that oil tube and, and, uh, and catch the inside of the car on fire, okay? Questions on the indicators? So here are a couple of the type of sending units that I was talking about. Um, the ones on the left are just contact switches. Okay, and then the ones on the right are variable resistors. Okay, so the ones on the left use warning lights. The ones on the right are using, um, are using uh, a variable resistor to change the voltage of the gauge. So if you look closely, um, this is just drawn as a basic electrical circuit. Um, on the left side, the electrical circuit is a switch. On the right side, it's a variable resistor. All right, I'm gonna move on. If there are any questions, please jump in. Oil monitoring system. So I got a few of you on the line still. Does anybody have this on their car? Yes. Okay, so does it monitor the mileage or does it monitor the oil life? Um, it monitors the oil life. So it has this feature where I could just uh, switch to the settings on the oil. And um, I think right now I have it at uh, 70% of oil lifespan remaining. Okay, cool. So, so one of the neat things is some of these vehicles use adaptive values and load conditions to determine the condition of the engine oil. Uh, so years ago, I heard a story uh, about a guy who had a BMW and he went to the, uh, at, you know, where Qualcomm used to be, they used to do the SCCA uh, sports racing in the parking lot. Um, he did the oil change on Friday on Saturday and Sunday, he went to the, the racing event. On Tuesday, his change oil light came on. So he was very upset because the car only had less than a thousand miles on the new oil. Well, the problem was the monitoring system uh, kept track and found that he was wide open throttle for most of the weekend. So driving the car under wide open throttle conditions is gonna cause additional wear on the engine oil. So when you're going wide open throttle, uh, fuel is getting past the piston rings. There's higher combustion temperatures and higher combustion pressures in the combustion chamber. All of these things create blow by, which, which are introduced to the engine oil. And these things affect the lifespan of the engine oil. So, so if you drive your vehicle easy, you might find that you can get more mileage out of, um, out of your oil than if you drive more aggressively, okay? So Jose, is that, does that sound about right? Uh, yes, um, actually when I first got, got the car, since I was still new, um, I took in a bit of a trip towards uh, San Francisco and then back, and I already had needed to do the oil change. Yeah. Were you driving fast? Uh, yeah, keeping it about like 80, 85 the whole way. Yeah, so the higher speeds 
The engine's working harder, it's gonna consume the oil faster. And when I say consume, I don't mean that it burns the oil, but what it does is it uses up the additives so the lifespan of the oil is, um, is shortened, okay? Any questions about that? Oil monitoring systems? Um, I, I did kind of a bit of a concern since mine has it like this kind of uh, monitoring type. Um, let's say the uh, the computer shows that it's time for an oil change, but I check the oil and the oil shows that it's still fine. Like um, when you check the level? Yeah. Yeah, so the oil level and the oil life are two different things, right? So just because the oil level is good, um, if you're driving the car very aggressively, the oil can get contaminated by gasoline and, and carbon from the extra pressure from, from the aggressive driving, right? So even though the oil level's full, the oil could be dirty and the additives could be spent. So it's, it would be time to change the oil so that you have fresh oil in there to protect the engine. Um, so that's different than if the oil was low and the engine was going to get damaged because there wasn't enough oil to lubricate the parts. Oh, okay. Okay. So when that oil life light comes on, you could drive it till it says, um, you know, 1% remaining and then change the oil then. What's, what will happen if you don't change the oil when the, when, when the monitoring system tells you is you will start to develop sludge. Oh, oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. All right, anybody else? All right, so there's a couple of different types of lubrication systems. We have the pressure fed system. Okay, so this vehicle uses a pressure or force feed system where the oil is forced through the engine under pressure. All right, so this is most of our vehicles use this system. So you see the purple represents oil being forced into the crankshaft and then that oil drips off the crankshaft back into the pan uh, to be recycled through the system again, okay? Um, so this is uh, pressure fed systems. Yeah, so a gasoline engine would be your wet. So diesel engines, they operate at the top of their power range. Uh, diesel engines usually uh, don't have a very wide range of RPM. So they're being used um, at, like a generator, right? At just one speed and, and, and they're doing all their work at that one speed. Um, so diesel engines have more British thermal units of heat and compression than gasoline engines. Um, a BTU is a British thermal unit. It is a measure of heat. So when you buy a heater or air conditioner, the measurement might be in BTUs, okay? Um, so the pressure fed systems um, that are used in diesel engines should be able to also handle higher shear forces, okay? So we're we're taking that oil and we're pressurizing it and then pushing it into the engine's moving parts. Has anyone ever cut the grass, used a lawnmower, generator, or other device that, that has an engine that you start with a rope? Yes. Okay, so this is your splash lubrication. So most of those engines don't have an oil pump, but at the bottom of the connecting rod, it has this little finger. So as that piston reciprocates up and down, that little finger comes down, scoops a little bit of oil, and then as the piston comes up, it splashes the oil into the gears and splashes the oil onto the bottom of the piston, um, and that's called splash lubrication. Um, so this engine is a horizontal crank. Some engines have a vertical crank like a lawnmower, so on a lawnmower, the vertical crank, there might be an extra gear coming off the camshaft that has um, a little wheel with little flappers that splash the oil onto the moving parts. Questions about that? So that's splash lubrication. 
you're usually only going to see that on small engines, small air cooled engines is the most common place to see that setup. All right, the two stroke engine premix. So this two stroke engines, if you remember, two stroke engines don't have an oil sump, right? They have a crankcase, fresh oil, uh, air and fuel get pulled into that crankcase. We have to mix the oil with the fuel so that when the fuel gets pulled into the crankcase, the oil that's attached to the fuel lubricates the moving parts. The mixture of air, oil, and fuel pass through a sealed crankcase to the combustion chamber. Fuel evaporates when entering the crankcase, leaving behind enough oil to keep the parts coated and lubricated. Okay, so that's how two-stroke engines work. So a two-stroke engine, you're not going to find a dipstick or a place to add oil. The oil gets mixed with the fuel. Okay. The exception would be if you have a two-stroke engine with oil injection. So some vehicles back in the day that used two strokes had oil injection. And what would happen is you would have this oil injection pump that would inject a calibrated amount of oil into the carburetor um, as the vehicle was driven. Okay, so you would put regular gasoline in the fuel tank, but then there was a separate reservoir for your two stroke engine oil, okay? So it says oil injection system is used by two stroke gasoline engines. Uh, the last vehicle I saw this on was a Suzuki motorcycle that I owned. It was like a 1971. So I don't know how common this is, uh, but if you're buying a newer two stroke, if they're even available anymore, it might have something like this on it. Okay, questions about this system? <clears throat> All right, so these last five slides are the summary. I'm not going to read the summary to you. But what I am going to do is I have to show you guys a couple more things and then we'll be done. How are we doing? Anybody still there? Uh, yeah, still here. Um, yes, I'm still here. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Who was that? Cool. Thanks, Stephen. Somebody had a question. Was that Jose? Uh, yes, I kind of wanted to go back kind of to like the uh, where the lawnmower uh, part that you were talking about. Yes. Um, so on the one that we used to have, um, so we would check and um, the oil was fine. Uh, we checked like the gas, the gas was fine, but it still wouldn't like turn on. Oh yeah, so sometimes you could have low compression. You could have a problem with the spark plug. You could have a problem with the carburetor or fuel system. So, so remember, there's three things it takes for an engine to start. You need air, which is good compression. You, uh -huh. need, you need a good fuel supply. And you need good spark. Right? So whenever you have something like that that doesn't start, the first thing you need to do is check compression. Then check for spark. Then check for fuel. So how do you check for spark on a lawnmower? Uh, it will be with the, uh, with the can shaft, right? Uh, making sure that the lubricant is, uh, when the piston goes down and then it scoops off the, um, the oil back up and then splits it just, we gotta make sure that those pieces are um, connected together properly, right? Well, yeah, yeah, so that's gonna be your lubrication system. But if the vehicle, if the engine's not starting, um, the lubrication system um, isn't really one of the things that we check. If the engine's not starting, we're gonna be checking for compression, which is the test that we did last week. We're gonna be checking for spark, which is where the spark plug is. So the best way to check compression on a, uh, or to check for spark is to take out the spark plug Make sure the spark plug is touching the engine block and then pull the cord. And then you should be able to see a little spark at the end of that spark plug. If you can see a spark, that means you have good spark. And you put the spark plug back. Usually what happens on lawnmowers and small engines like that is they sit for a long time 
and the fuel goes bad. And then the sediment that's left behind plugs up the carburetor. Oh, okay. So, so you have to take apart the carburetor very carefully, clean it all out with a little carburetor spray. Sometimes you can use a toothpick or small brushes, clean out all the little tiny holes. If you're very careful, you can use compressed air to blow out the little holes, uh, clean it all up really good. Hopefully you don't damage any gaskets, put it back together, put fresh fuel and it should start. But um, that's, that's the most common reason a lawnmower wouldn't start or small engine. Uh, oh, okay then, well now I know for next time. Yeah, and you know, I sold on, on Sunday or Monday, I sold a motorcycle that I had um, a few months ago. I had it running, I drove it around the block, fired it up. Uh, you know, put a new battery in it, put air in the tires, like, and I've been trying to sell it. And my buddy's like, Hey, I want to pick up that motorcycle. So it came to my house on Monday. It's only been a few months. And I went out to the garage to try to start it. And the fuel had dried out in the carburetor and I couldn't even twist the throttle. It wouldn't start. Everything was plugged up. I pulled apart the carburetor and there's just all the sediment from the gas. The gas these days is, is not very good. So it's real important that if you are using a, um, a small engine and you're, you have an engine that's going to be stored for a while, you want to take the gas out. You don't want to leave the gas inside of it. Okay, so uh, pretty much either try to use um, as much of it as possible or just empty out the tank. Yeah, and then some gas tanks on the small engines have like a little valve where you can turn the gas off. You know uh -huh. what I'm talking about? So uh, yeah. what I do... Like I have a chipper shredder for when I'm cutting my trees. Um, and what I do is instead of turning off the chipper shredder, I just turn off the gas and then I let it burn off the gas that's in the carburetor. Does that make sense? So the carburetor stays clean. So there's no gas in the carburetor. And then whatever's left in the gas tank, I make sure that the gas tank's full so that the fuel doesn't evaporate out. So next time I go to use it, it's going to have gas in it. Oh, okay. Okay. And they also sell uh, this, they also sell fuel additives for if you're storing the car. I think one of the good ones is called a uh, fuel stabilizer. Um, let's see here. Here we go, let me share this with you. So I use this on my vehicles that are gonna be parked for a long time. It's called Fuel Stable, S-T-A-B-I-L. Okay, uh, so you can, should be able to get that at any of your auto parts stores. Okay, there's different sizes. It's not very cheap, but it is like one of the best products. Yeah, I don't know how much it is, but see, there's different ones. Enzyme, what's this one? Lucas Fuel Stabilizer. So all the different companies have it. The stable is the best one, and that prevents the fuel from, from going bad if you're going to be storing it for long periods of time. Okay, anybody else have questions? All right, no questions. So uh, the last two things I was gonna show you are checking oil pressure. So the next couple labs I'm gonna introduce are, um, let's see how long this video is, six minutes. I'm not gonna bore you guys with videos. I'm just gonna show you the tool here. One of the neat things about this next lab is when you check the oil pressure, you're gonna check it from the same spot where the oil pressure sending unit is located. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna remove the oil pressure sensor or oil pressure sending unit, and then you're gonna screw this hose right into the spot where that sending unit came from. Um, so sometimes you use the hose, 
sometimes you use one of these adapters and then you can start the engine and you can watch the oil pressure on this gauge. So it's an oil pressure gauge, okay? Um, let's see here. An oil pressure sending unit looks something like this. You guys see these sending units here? It just screws into the engine block. Oh, hold on, am I sharing that? Yeah, I am. Here, that one's for a Cummins diesel engine. Okay, so you see the end there is just a pipe thread. It screws into the engine block. And then inside of here is a variable resistor that sends information to the computer or the instrument panel uh, so the needle will show the proper pressure. Um, and then some of the more simple systems use a, um, a single terminal like this guy here, okay? This is an oil pressure switch. So this oil pressure switch has how many wires? One. one it just has the one wire right so that's your ground wire so this housing is grounded to the block and this wire when there's no oil pressure is connected to a switch that's inside of this housing so when that uh when that switch closes because there's no oil pressure it completes the circuit the oil pressure warning light comes on when you start the engine the oil pressure opens the switch the light goes out and you know you have oil pressure. Okay, so that's your oil pressure sending unit. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's one style I was trying to find that I wanted to show you guys. Here we go. So you guys see this style here has kind of this funky shape. Mm -hmm. Many of the cars you work on are gonna have this style where it has this funky shape. So this doesn't really, uh, let's see. Here we go. Here's another one with that funky shape. You guys see that? So to get that off, use a tool called the oil pressure sending unit socket. And that socket also has the same shape as the oil pressure sending unit. So see, it's not a regular six point hexagon. It actually has the rounded corners uh, specifically made for an oil pressure sending unit. Any questions on that? Okay, so that's your oil pressure sending unit. Okay, this one has for two different size units, right? So the smaller size is deep inside the larger size is on the outside. Okay, so if you're gonna be doing this for a living, I recommend you purchase one of these as well um, for the vehicles that you're working on. Okay, this way you always have it. So you're gonna remove that oil pressure sending unit uh, and then you're gonna get into connecting the oil pressure gauge. which is this image I just shared with you guys. Let me pull it up again. So there's your oil pressure gauge. So you'll take out the sending unit using that special socket, and then you'll use wrenches to install this gauge. Then you can start your engine and run your oil pressure test. Okay, you guys with me? Yep. Okay. Once you get data from this test, we can then hook up our sending unit. We could take this off, plug our sending unit back in, and compare that data to the information we're seeing on our instrument panel. 
So if our instrument panel has a gauge, we can compare the pressure on the gauge uh, on the instrument panel to the pressure on the gauge in our toolbox. And if the pressures are close, then we know that our uh, oil pressure system is working properly. If we have a warning light system, we know that if we ground the wire and the light comes on, and then we open the circuit and the light goes out, we know that the circuit is working properly. The next trick would be to find uh, if the, if the um, sending unit is stuck open or closed circuit, okay? Are you, anybody taking electrical class? Uh, me, yeah. Yeah, so ho hopefully you've learned what open and closed circuit is by now, okay? Cool, all right. So the last thing, and then we're gonna call it a night. Uh, oil pressure sensor. This last thing comes with a little bit of a story and then I'm done. So I worked for Chrysler. Uh, the vehicle I was working on was a Chrysler Sebring. I think it was this style connector here. Is it here? Let's see if they show. See, you can buy a lot of cool stuff here on eBay. All right, so let me share my screen and then I'll tell my story. So I don't know, I was 20, 20 something working at the dealer and a customer came in with a Chrysler Sebring convertible. Are you guys familiar with that car? I don't know, they're pretty old now. They're probably 20 years old now. Chrysler Sebring convertible, it had a 2.5 liter V6. Uh, dual overhead cam engine. They were kind of fun little cars. Um, this customer said that on summer days when they're sitting at a red stoplight, the oil pressure warning light would flicker. So I hooked up an oil pressure gauge, drove the car around the neighborhood, and, and sure enough, at idle, red light, middle of summer, normal operating temperatures, the oil pressure was about four PSI. Four PSI is pretty low, um, but long story short, I come to find out four PSI is normal for that vehicle um, uh, in, in those conditions. The oil pressure warning light was designed to come on around three PSI, okay? Um, but, they were, but, but it was coming on at four PSI. So um, before I knew what the threshold was, I assumed that four PSI was too low based on my knowledge from other vehicles. So what did I replace? If the oil pressure is low, you either have a bad oil pump or bad engine. So what I ended up doing, this vehicle was under warranty. I just went and I ordered an engine from the manufacturer. I said, oh, it's under warranty. It needs an engine, it's got low oil pressure. So I ordered an engine. I uh, order a short block. The short block is the engine block, pistons, crankshaft, just the bottom end of the engine. It comes in, uh, you know, gets to the parts department. I pick up the short block. I bring it into my bay. I transfer over all the cylinder heads. I transfer all the uh, accessories. Uh, I time the engine. I get it back in the car. Put it all back together. I go road test the vehicle. I stop at a red light. Guess what comes on? Yeah, oil pressure. the oil pressure warning. warning light starts flashing again right so at this point i'm like and there's actually another incident i got the wrong head gaskets so the engine made a weird noise the first time so then i had to take the engine apart again remove it take it apart put the correct head gaskets on that vehicle there's two styles the head gaskets had different thicknesses and i put the wrong head gaskets on it so um, so after I got the correct head gaskets, I went and road tested the engine, the warning light came on again. 
So the oil pressure setting unit on this car was actually a switch for this specific car, but the connector was like the one you see in this diagram. It had three wires because on some vehicles, it actually had a gauge. On other vehicles, it just had the light. Well, I on the vehicle I had, they only used one terminal in this connector. So if you look, let me rotate the image. If you look on the back where the wires go in, um, only one of those wires was being used. I think it was the one on the far left was being used. So the two wires on the right, in, uh, instead of leaving the hole open, Chrysler had a special little pin that they put in there so the wet, so the so the connector would be weather tight, meaning water can and moisture cannot get in. Does this make sense? Yep. All right. Awesome. So I called Chrysler engineers and I said, this is my problem. This is what I've done. I know I jumped the gun on ordering the engine, but I really need to fix this car. I want to give it back to the customer. And Chrysler said, Here's what we want you to do. You're not the only one dealing with this right now. We want you to pull out the little pin on the open cavity of the connector. I said, why? He said, just try it and call me when you're done. So I pulled the little pins out from the open cavities, right? So, so the connector on the orange wire was the one that was used for the switch. The other two were just these little plastic plugs. So I took out the plastic plugs, I drove the car and it fixed the problem, right? So I had about 30 hours of work in this car, easy 30 hours of work. Uh, and the entire problem was a little tiny half a cent plastic pin that was inside that connector. So the problem was this, the warning, the, the, the switch was designed to close the contact at three PSI. At four PSI, the light was coming on. Well, what was happening in hot weather, this connector was weather tight. So in hot weather, the little bit of air that was inside of the connector would expand, push on the opposite side of the diaphragm inside of the sending unit, and produce a temporary three PSI condition, which would cause the light to flicker. By pulling out those pins, it vented the connector, which allowed the oil pressure to overcome the switch, which allowed the light to stay out when I was parked at a red light. And that's my story about oil pressure sending units. Kind of fascinating, right? Maybe not on Zoom, but still a fascinating story. That car beat me up. Um, but either way, this is your oil pressure setting unit connector. You guys are going to be pulling these off next week. And um, we'll be checking some oil pressures. Uh, it's real important that we know the specs of the engine before we condemn the engine that the oil pressure is bad. Okay. So anyways, that was my story. And I'm gonna do one last call for questions on tonight's lesson here. No questions. I wanna appreciate you guys for sticking it out. Um, so tonight, once again, we covered oil, uh, uh, oil lubrication uh, theory, chapter uh, 14. Chapter 14 is open now. You guys are welcome to check that out. Uh, I showed you the link for the SP2 lesson, so please knock that out if you can. Um, I made the due date uh, the last day of February, which is the 28th. I think that gives you five days to get through 14. If you need an extra day or two, please just email me so I know that you're still working on it. Otherwise, uh, if you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to excuse you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Have a good Appreciate night. It. Proud of you guys for sticking with me Thank on you. that. Have a good night. You too. Thank you.